And I went out to the club. I was so nervous. But immediately, something about when you're in drag, people feel open to, to talk to you. And they said, like, you look great. You're, you're doing such a good job. I didn't. Is the truth. <laughs> you know, you know that, now. I know yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. But just that encouragement, that's like, that's one of the things that's so radical is we just encourage each other. See, meet each other where we are and encourage each other. Yeah. And that love that we need so much, like, fuels something. In, in some ways, the book is about your own personal history. In some way, the book is about the history of drag. It's sort of, again, like uh, about how we how we are taught about drag, what we know and what we don't know about drag. I want to start with you. C- can you tell me a little bit um, about your grandmother, as a grandma Dina? Yes. And she was the first person to put you in, in drag. Can you tell Absolutely. me that story? Absolutely. I think she might have been the first drag queen I met too. She was just a really extravagant person who loved wearing sequins and would put on makeup every day and would style her hair. And the rest of my family were kind of hippie who just went more natural. But I felt this gravitational pull to elevated and artificial glamour for some reason. And she became like, she ushered me into that world, helped me dress up in her clothes, taught me the art of the reveal, I suppose. I began reflecting on the ways that she helped me put on little shows just in her condominium for my grandfather, who was never a very willing participant, but (laughs) indulged anyways. And I didn't realize at the time how rare that was for someone to, without saying, oh, you're gay or oh, you're queer or whatever, just say, oh, you you like to perform, you like to dress up, let me help you. This is so much fun and you should have fun with life. You're saying that at the time, you it was just sort of your everyday. It was sort of like, that. that's just my relationship with my grandmother. It's only now looking back that you're reflecting that, wow, that was actually a pretty pretty remarkable yeah. relationship to have with her. And hearing, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of people like me who, who have someone in their family who accepted them. But for those who don't have that familial support, it's it sounds like so precious and priceless. And I, I recognize how lucky I am. The, and it was your other grandmother, I think you, you describe her as like the, the walking internet? <laughs> yeah. Or like the internet her, before the internet? She issues. knew everything. My grandma Joe, my mom's mom, um, was a reference librarian from Michigan. And she taught me the word drag. <laughs> she taught you? The, what do you remember from, from about that? I remember she had, I mean, she always was teaching me words and catchphrases. I didn't know if it was like a, a real word or something she had made up. But she had a picture in her album from her photo album of her brother uh, dressed up in drag for like a community center event. He was a straight guy with a family. or mm-hmm. So that's as far as I know. Mm-hmm. Um, that made me, I think about that now because... Drag was something totally normal to this woman born in 1911 in the Midwest. Drag wasn't something shocking or perverse. It was something fun. And I, I hope we can get people back to that place. You, you're saying, I mean, we're going to touch on this a little bit later in the conversation, but you're, you're saying, you know, even it, it was in 1911, you said? She was born in 1911. So this person who was alive in like the 1910s and 1920s yeah. and 1930s, drag was more acceptable or was more everyday than even it is now. This, this, this sort of occurs to you. Absolutely. Yeah, and even like queer people doing drag. I, I'm sure she knew there was the connection, um, but that drag was also something for everyone. I want to stay on your on your sort of trajectory here. Uh, tell me what goes through your mind when I mention the the, the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> um, oh, you, you've read this part of the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Wicked Witch of the West. Oh, I, I think Wizard of Oz was probably the first movie that my parents showed me. Yeah. And I guess I like screamed in terror at the Wicked Witch of the West and then asked to keep rewatching this segment because maybe the terror was a little bit of an attraction to her otherworldly glamour. Um, I, I, I try to like describe her really overflowingly in the book and her like beautiful tendrils of hair, her long train. Like, yes, she's supposed to be this terrifying, menacing figure, but she is also really fantastic. And she has a glamour to her. And I think, you know, maybe there's there's some way that the way kids made fun of me for being a little different, for being a little extravagant, I didn't know that I was gay, but I think that was probably something a little bit beyond the traditional bounds of how a boy was supposed to act was right. already present. So I connected with this figure who was feared and misunderstood I didn't connect with all the evil things she did, Mm -hmm. but I wanted to dress like her. So after I recovered from the fact that she had thrown fireballs and was burning down (laughs) villages, I asked if I could start dressing up as her. And I wanted a big skirt that I could swish around, a big hat, a broomstick. And I started acting out 
of all the scenes, the one where she dies, <laughs> which really, I think, is like, I'm still that person who why loves you, these dark moments. Why that one <laughs> of, all, of all the ones? Because she disappears into the floor in a poof of steam. And I thought, this is the most brilliant thing I've ever seen in my life. And I just wanted to, to have this reveal performance. So I would gather anyone who would watch, and I would give them a bucket. And I'd say, okay, now you throw, you mime throwing the bucket of water on me, and I'm going to do the witch's death monologue, basically. And I do the whole thing, the screaming, saying, I'm melting, I'm melting, oh, what a world, what a world. <laughs> <laughs> to think a little girl like you could, you know, yeah. destroy my beautiful wickedness. Yeah. And then I would shrink down to the ground, climb backwards out of whatever I was wearing, and run a- run away. Not not a very good reveal performance, but <laughs> run away in my underwear. I love I, I love these parts of the book, and, and, and we'll come back to them later, but like I love these parts of the book because I feel like it's you going like, oh, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. That's, I, see where I, I see where I came from now. I think the big reveal is realizing I've always been Sasha Valor. Yeah. It just took me a while <laughs> to catch up to it. <laughs> uh, another part of the book that I, I really loved is, is uh, again, how you talk about the history of drag. I mean... Yeah. Um, I didn't know that the um, even just the is the nomenclature is that the term sure. they, just the the term drag we're, we're not entirely sure where that term comes no, from. Everyone has a different story. Yeah, you know, even even the sort of the popular ones, they're not necessarily sure. You do some really g- good research there. You you write about the first recorded performances of drag. You talk. I mean, we just talked about it briefly. How it was perceived at various p- points in history, and uh, how it's perceived now. What is something that might be surprising? maybe to you or maybe to me or or to people listening to this that they might not know about drag that you uncovered in your research? I think think it was the extent of the popularity that drag had in the 1920s. In New York, it was called the pansy craze and everyone was going to drag balls. Um, It was kind of the birth of the modern nightclub, actually, was going to see drag performances and drag competitions in Harlem in like a largely black queer scene. Um, And... And then, like, in the 1960s, even, figures like Danny LaRue from the UK became worldwide sensations. He's the first drag queen who appeared in Vogue. And I I think a lot of times, even I thought, this is something totally new. It's getting more and more popular. Yeah. That's not really the case. It gets popular, and then there's a conservative pushback every time. People become afraid of maybe more empowered or more free forms of gender and, and try to make it criminal, literally create laws that criminalize the freedom and force people into m- more traditional, I guess, gender roles. So you're, you're saying that this, this um, I think I would have been the same as you. I would have thought, I mean, this is my own ignorance. I would have thought, you know, I had seen the, what's the name of that documentary about the balls in, in, in New oh, York? Oh, Paris is Burning. Yeah, Paris is Burning. So yeah. I think I would have thought, what era was that? that That's was, the 80s. Yeah, I think I would have thought like, okay, the 70s and, and 80s, and then it gains yes. steam and it becomes through through drag race, which we're going to talk about later, becomes this massive thing. Right. And now, and then there's drag brunches, and then yeah, now it's reaching young people and small towns. And there's going to be this pushback against it. But you're right. saying that's that's happened always. It's happened before. Yeah, it happened in the 20s. It happened even at the turn of the century. People were dressing up in drag, um, and it, it does become popular. Does that make you feel less comforted or, or more comforted? It makes me feel more comforted. Really? Because it shows how natural it is, and it shows that. These things happen in waves. We don't have to, I mean, of course, we do have to fear what's happening to our spaces and, like, figure out ways to survive, even if the laws are changing, to be more oppositional to the freedoms that maybe we've gotten used to. But I think there's an enduring love of queer people that the world has, an enduring acceptance of drag and dress-up and fluidity of gender and even if some people's voices become very loud and controversial, most people, I firmly believe, accept this as part of culture and as something wonderful. I'll tell you what's interesting about this is that, so I didn't tell you this when you came in, because I really wanted to, but I, I didn't. <laughs> um, I read uh, one of your dad's books. What? Oh, my goodness. Oh, he'll be so delighted. Can, can you say who your dad is? Yeah, my dad is Professor Mark D. Steinberg, who's a, a historian of, of the Russian Revolution, really, and of workers' histories. I um, I don't know if I have a question related to this, but I, I read, so I, be, I, I went through this period 
I'm still kind of in it where I became really obsessed with the Russian Revolution. And I read the Orlando Figgis book, The People's Tragedy. Oh, yeah. And then I read your one of your dad's books. I think it was The Russian Revolution, 1905 to 1921. Yes. Um, and again, it's it's he's he's a, someone who uh, tells the story of the revolution from the kind of the the ground floor perspective, yeah. the, the workers' perspective, including like the art that workers made that they didn't know was art at the time. That, that was that was revolutionary. <laughs> yes, that is his specialty and something he instilled in me at an early age to look for art where people don't even want to see it themselves. I'm seeing a con- <laughs> you know I'm seeing a connection right yeah, absolutely. I. Also felt comfort. So I was, I, I mean, I think I started reading about the revolution when I felt like there was this great unrest in the world. Yeah. And I felt like I had never experienced anything like it. And we had never experienced anything like it. And like yourself. And when I read your, your, your father's book and I read the other books, I was horrified to find out these unrests have always existed. Right. But in all of a sudden, in some ways, comforted to know that, this, that these, these, these ebbs and flows have happened before. Right. Yeah, that's so funny. I, he'll, he's going to listen to this and be really, really pleased. He's such a supporter of, of my drag. And I see the ways that his research, his, his interest in revolution, his focus on ordinary people's experience, or not just experience of world events, but contribution to the movement of culture and time, like that's shaped everything I do. And he's flattered me to say that my interest in drag has ignited a new window in his research. Is he's, that so? He's studying like the queer underground now and its role in city life. So I feel like that's a little we give back to each other. It must feel meaningful. It's amazing. I think, you know, to have a, a parent who's listening to what you have to say is like the best gift. Well, that's very clear in the book that your parents, uh, both your, both in your mom and your dad, are supportive of you. Yeah. Like, you know, whether they're helping you put on, you know, put on plays or they're helping you get <laughs> costumes. What was the line? I think it was your mom says it at one point, like where you weren't, you, you weren't interested in much. <laughs> yeah. So when you were interested in something, we wanted to support you. <laughs> yeah. I was terribly indecisive and could never make up my mind as a child. Maybe there's some, some fluidity and I could chalk, <laughs> chalk it up to that as well. Uh, I just wanted to be in between things. Uh, but they, yeah, they, I, I love that because it's kind of shady actually to say like you could never make up your mind. So when you had an idea, we were, we knew we had to jump and support it, but, but they knew me. I think that's, that's the point. They knew me and they just let me be myself. Do you, do you ever take a moment and realize that maybe that was rare? Oh, absolutely. It's so rare. And even though I'm, I'm not a parent myself, I want to I want to pay that forward. I want to give that to all the drag performers that I bring to my shows, for example. I, I want I want to look at them and say, you know, kind of like what you're doing for me right now to say, like, I see you and I just want you to take this opportunity to to share yourself with people, because I know, like, from a family perspective, how much that empowered me and how rare that was. And to give that as in a community way or even in a creative professional way means so much to people. It, it helps people. That's such a lovely way of putting it. Yeah, I must admit, when I, re- when I was reading those parts of the stories about your parents, I mean, it's so sad to say, actually, in some ways. Yeah. I was reading it and going, oh, my God. I, I, I mean, I, I know people who, who, who are participate in drag, and I know, you know, and I, for, I mean, almost exclusively, and maybe some of them, actually, I don't, not just in case they're listening, but, like, <laughs> I mean, virtually all of them we wouldn't have had the same support system. That, that did jump out to me. Right. Well, yeah, we hear what not having support does for yeah. queer people, how hard that is. But to hear what it can yeah. build, yeah. that's kind of the opposite side. It really it really proves how needed it is. Tell me about Dracula. Dracula. <laughs> Dracula is my first excuse to wear lipstick. So he's very <laughs> important to me. <laughs> I thought this is just the blood dripping down from my fangs as I smeared glossy red Ooh. lipstick all over my mouth. What? So what, what, what happened? What, like, how, how did Dracula? How, well, I know the story, but tell, tell me the story. Oh, well, I didn't know what Dracula was when kids at school called me Dracula. I have really pale skin, really dark hair. It turns out my family is from Romania, a <laughs> bunch of Romanian Jews. But uh, I, I, I love this character, this old world figure who comes and causes chaos in, the modern, in modern England from <laughs> Eastern Europe. And uh, yet again, dies in a poof of smoke really dramatically. So these are... The characters that immediately resonate with me, and I started dressing up for Halloween as Dracula, and it was it was my first experiment with makeup, getting to put a pale foundation on, bright red lips, bushy eyebrows. You see, I'm still doing this exact makeup plot. How did it feel? It felt 
freeing to become Dracula. It felt like the thing I had been afraid I looked like, when I fully embraced it, I, I loved myself so much more as Dracula. And a freedom to, to you, play a character. You loved yourself so much more as Dracula? Yes, I did. I, like for this, this thing that people had said to be mean to me, that I looked like a vampire, when I actually leaned in and embraced being looking like a vampire and realized maybe a bit of the distance between the real me and this vampire, but also just how fun it is to be over the top, to play with the idea of being scary, knowing that I'm not really... That, that brought joy. I think there's a, I think for people who are listening to this, they would think, oh, that's the moment that Sasha's born. Oh, like that's the moment that, oh, yeah, but like it, it actually goes on for a little while. <laughs> oh, yeah, I this. wish I could have figured it out that quickly. You, you were a Fulbright scholar. Yeah. Um, in, you, and you traveled to, to Russia. Yes, I did. In after college. After college. Where'd you go to college? I went to Vassar College. Went, went to, so then, and yeah. then, and, but still, still, we don't know, still no drag yet, right? I was dressing up all the time, and I, but I felt I had to keep it secret. I didn't know any drag queens out in the world except for RuPaul and Divine. And I feel like, even to this day, I'm not, I'm not quite either of those paths. Yeah, Maybe some strange combination, but I, I didn't see a place for myself in that world. I just knew I loved wearing dresses and putting makeup on. But I, felt, I still felt a lot of shame about that. Shame I had learned in school from other kids, primarily. Um, but a little bit fear of also of what my parents would say, which was... Even with all that support. Even with all that support. Because yeah, yeah. there's so much messaging that it's wrong, and I didn't want to disappoint them. Yeah. So I didn't even want to tell them. Yeah. yeah and and you, you were a Fulbright scholar, so you traveled to, is it Moscow? I traveled to Moscow. I put together, I studied Russian, inspired by my dad and my, gra- my grandma Dina, who was born in a Russian Yiddish-speaking uh, in, community. In, in Manchuria, right? In Manchuria, yeah. yeah, yeah. In, oh, Manchuria. in China, yeah, yeah. what's yeah. now China. Um, and she spoke Chinese as well, uh, but forgot it all when she came to America because it was like a terrible time to be an immigrant. So, so when you're in Moscow, how, how are you feeling? Um, I had to be very closeted. Yeah, I would say. I still like had my fashion sense and I think I read about it in the book, but someone once like stopped me on the street and, and addressed me as, as a girl because of how I was dressed. And I turned around and was like, oh, I'm happy to help you get directions to McDonald's or wherever. And she ran away. She gasped that I was not a girl and ran away screaming. It was a very, it's a Russia, the Russia that I went to was a very conservative, of course. Um, restrictive and very gendered place. A place where women wear high heels and pantyhose in the middle of winter and short skirts. So it kind of like ignited some of my love of the artificial feminine again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I couldn't quite express it there. And I, I was connecting with queer activists there. In it was there, a yeah. secret part of my Fulbright proposal to because you have to get approval from the Russian government. So I presented it as a, a focus on political art that was available for free in the city. And I ended up talking to queer activists to find out what kind of protests they were doing, what kind of art they were making. They didn't really see it as art <laughs> typical for like in my family's research. Yeah, give, give, give them what your dad was writing about. Yeah, yeah. I, I really saw the poetry, the protests, the signs, the essays they were making as art, um, but really engaged, important art. And it made me want to make more queer art myself and speak to the inequalities and and create possibilities and imagine a better world for queer people through creativity. So connect the dots between that and so you, you come back to Illinois. Yes. And that's when you start participating in drag, right? Yeah, I, I did my first like lip sync performance to a Rihanna song in someone's communal Russian apartment <laughs> because I started watching Drag Race while I was in Russia, right? illegally downloading episodes the first season. And that was the first time I saw people who really played with gender and kind of androgynous drag, artistic drag. And I, I began to see that this thing I had always been doing would match up with the world of drag. And I, I read about Sylvia Rivera while I was in Russia as well, uh, one of the greatest activists, queer and trans activists, I think, of the 20th century, who called herself a drag queen, but she was also a trans woman, and created a home for, home for people unhoused, queer and trans people, and interrupted pride protests to say, you're not making enough space here for trans people, for 
cross-dressers or whatever because these terms do keep changing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she was really my biggest inspiration to start doing drag. How, how did it go the first time? I went out in my hometown in the middle of the cornfields. I got dressed up in my mom's bathroom, and uh, she she and I had a little fight about how much mess I made, which is why why I clean up after myself to this day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I ended up talking to the local drag host because there was a drag show happening that night at the gay bar and asking how I, how I could be a part of it. And she said, well, we have a competition once a month on Sundays. So text me if you're here for the next one and I'll enter you into the competition. We'll, we'll see how you do. <laughs> but if you do well, you can have a slot here. When did you start to get good? Because you're good. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, gosh. I think I was okay at the competition. I got second place. Pretty good? Pretty good, yeah. There was a, there was a lot of competitors. Yeah, sure. I, I definitely, I had experience as an actor, I I guess. So I knew how to bring drama and yeah. practice as a child. I think I started getting good about two years into it when I, I moved to New York City mm. and talk about great drag. Mm. Brooklyn, mm. the Brooklyn drag scene was so creative. Mm. People brought really smart ideas that could belong in any museum, in any theater, um, and would blow people away. So there's a lot a lot of competition, I guess. What a difference in you in just a few years, hey? I mean, like yeah. it wasn't that long before that you were in it's Russia, practice. you know? And no, but like it just wasn't in your own yeah. life. It wasn't that long ago before that, just a few years before that you were in Russia, you know? Yeah. I felt like I drew on the, the experience that I had. Yeah. So maybe I, I had been writing about queer theory and politics. So yeah. I, I brought that to the microphone. I, that's what I knew about. So I talked about it. And slowly but surely, I kind of figured out. Now, um... I only talk about this as much as you as you want to. Um, I was uh, struck by the way you write about your mom um, in this in this book. Again, as much as you want to here, but um, y you are really candid in the book about the. I mean, we've been talking about the sort of social and political, and um, I guess um, identity based ways that um, drag made you feel more authentic to who you are. Yeah. I was. Um, struck by how, and I had never read anything like this before, about how drag had, had had helped you with like an eating disorder. Yeah. And I was particularly struck by, so your mom is, gets, she, she gets sick. She gets, she gets diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. And, and I love the way you write about that, that even just, I mean, I, I don't want to give it away, but like helping your mom get a wig. Yeah. You know, like drag helped you through, I can't, you know, drag helped you through that period of your life too. As much as you want to say, can you tell yeah. me more about that? Um, sure. I mean, as much as you want to. Yeah, I know. No, I'm going to get emotional. Yeah. Um, I didn't mm. want to ruin your makeup either. You know? <laughs> Thank you. I have a show tonight. <laughs> it, it was just this moment of connection where she was, she was really vulnerable and I, I was kind of going through a vulnerable time as well. And we, we were able to talk about her experience of gender and her experience of beauty and the, the pressures to look a certain way as a woman in this world. And she was plenty curious about the drag that I was starting. I didn't share everything with her because I was still nervous, but I shared a little bit. And not all of it made sense to her as a feminist, as a woman. Yeah. Um, but I was more interested in soaking up what she was going through and learning about her own experiences because she was very, very glamorous to me, actually. Um, even though she had never been one for makeup or never, never styled her hair or wore high heels, Something about her experience of femininity was really inspiring to me. And the fact that she felt she lost her access to beauty as someone going through cancer just by losing her hair was devastating. Um, and I, I loved that drag had bald queens. It already was a thing. There were figures like Kevin Aviance in New York. I saw Angina on RuPaul's Drag Race. So to be beautiful and feminine and bald was possible in this queer world in a way that my mom didn't get to experience in the real life. People would look at her like there was something wrong. Um, so to get to kind of reinterpret my, my mom's look, yeah. this bald look, yeah. and a face that looks like hers, um, and have people say it's beautiful in, in this world uh, means so much to me because I, I feel like I'm advocating for her. Yeah. Maybe in a way she didn't fully experience you, you're taking before it, she died. You're taking it in for her too. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Fine. I don't know if you hear that. The sound I'm hearing right now is every single person 
listening to this interview right now, screaming at their podcasts <laughs> and their phones and their radios for me to ask you about the lip sync. Oh, sure. <laughs> yes. I love to talk about I that. I can hear it. I can hear <laughs> people screaming at me right now to do it. So let me, let me, let me set this up a little bit. Uh, season nine, right? Yes. Season nine of RuPaul's Drag Race. You're going against Shea Coule. The song was so emotional by Whitney Houston. You come out with this beautiful red wig, this beautiful dress. At the climax of the song, you pull off the wig and, and rose petals fall down. Rose petals are falling throughout the entire performance. The crowd goes wild. It became maybe the most defining moment of Drag Race up to that point, if not still. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, I think it was the first Drag Race moment that got parodied on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> like it entered a mainstream yeah. zeitgeist Wait, I'm glad you. I'm glad you want to talk about it because I was <laughs> I like, "Oh my that. god, is she tired of talking about it?" Talk to me a little bit about that performance. What do you remember about it? What was going through your mind while you were doing it? How do you, how do you practice that? <laughs> I I did practice it. They gave us a, two days with the songs, and I was determined to put together a a story with the performance because that's what I always do when I perform in drag, and I wanted it to be about my mom a little bit. She she had always really idolized red hair, even though everyone in my family has brown hair. Um, so I, I put together this beautiful red wig and this kind of conservative dress. And I thought this is a story about someone who is trying to manage their emotions, but they just, as the lyrics suggest, they just get almost out of hand. And the chaos that they cause is beautiful as well as a little too much. So I thought this metaphor of the rose, a classic symbol of love, becomes something beyond a flower and becomes an explosion. So I, I figured out how to stuff my gloves full of rose petals um, and how to put them inside my wig as well. It was magic. Like I mean, quite literally. Like it felt like I was watching a magic. It's, it's so sim It's funny. It's so simple, but it's really like I I. I go really hard when I perform. So it's like just the sheer force of of ripping the glove that quickly sends the petals in like an arc through the space. And the same thing with the way I, I shook my wig. That's what like cascades them over the face. They're just stuffed up in there. <laughs> so <laughs> did you have any idea that it was gonna have the impact that it did? Not any idea at all. I, I wasn't sure if it would even work, to be honest, because I hadn't practiced it in makeup or with a sweaty head. I was worried I was going to be sweaty and it was uh, going to stick to my head. Yeah. Um, but but I had done drag in bizarre conditions in my, the years of practice in Brooklyn nightclubs, getting ready in like a mop closet and then giving the show of a lifetime on the stage. And I had always been kind of performing like it was a lip sync for your life, I suppose. So to actually be in those conditions, suddenly I knew exactly what to do. And I, I gave the whole performance just staring at RuPaul because she meant so much to me and I wanted to, I, I wanted to show her how much I can do on stage. Um, so my goal was to get her to react and to smile and to feel some, some joy. And when I took the wig off, she, her, she got shocked. <laughs> <laughs> After you, uh, after you win, um, um, the, there's a comic in the book that's like, um, is your manager asking you if you want to sell makeup <laughs> or, do, uh, or make a dance track? Which my, my understanding is that's, that's what a lot of drag queens would do after, yeah. after drag race. And you say in the comic something like, but I'm an artiste. <laughs> Poking fun at myself. What do you mean by that? <laughs> that's my internal voice. Thankfully, like everyone I've worked with understands what my, what my style is. No one's pushed me to do anything like that, but I have an internal voice that sometimes questions whether I should be pushing myself in more traditional ways, try following a more classic celebrity path to try to advance my profile or whatever, have more opportunities like I see other people have. Uh, but I guess for better or worse, there's this other voice of me that's like, you have to stay true to yourself. That's why you started doing drag is to celebrate the artistry, to develop a unique style and stay true, true to it. So, Because you could have written a book about your own story. I don't you know? think, I actually honestly don't know if I could have because of this like this sensibility of, of how. Every time I started writing my own story, I, I got sidetracked by, by the context. 
I felt like it was incomplete without the context. I mean, but and so much. I mean, I, I loved reading those parts of the book. I mean, you know, everything from like the indigenous history of drag to the again the the social and political history of drag. I really enjoyed reading, and again, I'll profess my own ignorance here that like the how we got to a place where we perceive drag as men dressing up as women, but what it actually is, and how it, how we it explores the non-binary nature of gender. Like it was it was a really fascinating. Like I guess. Um, I mean, basically, just why did you want to do more than that? Why did you want to tell more than just your own story? Why did you want to get into the, the history of, of the medium? It's complicated. And I feel like a lot of people avoid going there because of we. there isn't such a clear record of people's experiences. A lot of times with different language gaps, it's hard yeah. to know, like, was this drag? Was this trans expression? Was this just cross-dressing. And, 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 such, and sadly, too, I, I would yeah. imagine the lack of that that record-keeping would be based around shame or would be based around like that oh, society. Would, yeah, yeah, of course. And you know? the criminalization yeah. of you, all of forms of expression. I, yeah. I was really shocked learning how many colonial expansions around the world that obviously deprive people of land and freedom also like killed queer people or mm-hmm. expressions of queerness. They didn't even care what it was, whether it was authentic, whether it was dress-up performance. They just thought it was evil, Mm -hmm. kind of like what we're hearing now. Mm -hmm. And I I wanted to connect to that history and try to do it carefully. I had all this experience from my Fulbright talking about the pitfalls of translation. So I felt like in some ways equipped to talk about these different experiences of drag and different experiences of queerness that are so similar, but also just a little bit beyond what we can immediately claim as Mm -hmm. the same and still build connection. Because I do think the community is already very different from itself, even now. So to look at the past and say, okay, this is a similar thread, but we each are experiencing it, expressing it in different ways. And then the reception in the world can be very different as well. I, I want to talk more about that. And I want to talk more a little bit about perceptions of drag, um, I- including, I-, I guess, the vehicle that you are incredibly grateful for that would have you know, kind of really brought you to, to where today, which is RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, you... you um, in a very respectful way, you write about RuPaul's Drag Race. You write, I once went to an academic lecture about drag where the speaker's only primary sources were episodes of RuPaul's Drag Race. No offense, but we can't base our entire understanding of drag around one TV show. And, and it reminded me of this conversation I had, I think it was just the other day, right? With um, uh, Murray Hill. Oh, yes. An icon of Do drag. you know Murray? Absolutely. We're good friends uh, in New York. I had a great chat with him. He, he, he kept on calling me <laughs> Tommy. Showbiz. Kept on calling me Tommy the I'm entire sure. interview. Going, Tommy, let me tell you something now. Tommy. You know, we had the best. We had the best chat. Um, and he he said a similar thing. He said, you know, um, uh, as a drag king, he hasn't seen the same level of representation. And he said, like, listen, the the the, the history of the medium goes. Medium, the art, the, the yeah. expression goes far beyond uh, drag race. Again, with no disrespect to drag race. Yeah. Why did you want to talk about that in the book? Oh, because it is so widespread. People are act like it is a a textbook of drag, but it's just it's just a celebration of it on a reality TV show. I think it's probably a reflection of the fact that it's so unavailable elsewhere. It's not a common part of school curriculum. It's not like it's not something you really see in a museum, particularly. So people gravitate. People love it, and they gravitate to what they can find. So I think it's our job to make it more available. We're getting pushback, but that's why we're going to press forward because this should be the fuller story, the the bigger picture, stories about drag kings, story about all the many, many cis women who take part in, we kind of hate those words, but you know, there you have it. Um, like Hate what words? Words like AFAB queens oh, or okay, yeah. having to distinguish what someone's out of drag gender even is. Oh, okay. But all the different, all the different types of people who take part in drag who don't get to be on on Drag Race necessarily, um, are a vital part of the community. I, I want people who love drag through Drag Race to come to love drag as it really is. I mean, and, and it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning. And one of the main things I took from this book is, again, how I, I was under the impression, and, and I think even for a moment you were, again, 1970s, 1960s, it you know, and, and then it blows up to the mainstream of RuPaul's Drag Race, and here we are. This is the pinnacle, and now you know, like again, that these things have all that drag has always been around in 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 for I mean centuries in different civilizations and under different names mm-hmm. forever. Yet here we are in in 2023, and I think we we should talk about it. You know, we are living in a time um, where more anti drag legislation is being introduced. Uh, most notably, the government of Tennessee recently banned drag performances in front of the public. Or minors. This is one of the many laws Tennessee has passed that target, targets LGBTQ plus rights. 
I, if you're listening to this in Canada, I don't, I don't want you to think we're getting a break either. You, you have massive protests yeah. still happening. We're seeing them all the time. We're seeing protests in, in particular in libraries. You know, it, and every single time I have someone on this show who, who's a drag performer, uh, I can't, you know, the, even just me as like a, 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 a cishet dude, the amount of hate I get, am, amplify that by like 40,000 um, is the experience of the people I get wow. to talk to. What do you hope this book's impact is at, at this time? It's an interesting time for the book to come out. Yeah, I hope people would share it with someone who is against drag. I'm curious. I'm kind of curious to find out what that experience will be like. Because I think a lot of us are very accepting and understand that to, to us, this backlash is completely ridiculous. Like to to want to tell someone dressed up, making art that they're disgusting or a pervert makes no sense because... Like of all the, of all the things that we are, that's definitely not one of them. Um, this world is full of people who actually do prey upon innocent young people and take advantage, and those are people who are deeply protected by institutions. Often, um, drag is a place of, that values consent very heavily. That is all about letting people have freedom over their own bodies and what happens to their bodies. So it's literally completely the opposite of of what the the backlash is is accusing drag of doing. So I hope some facts, I hope that personal stories from that I tell from yeah. history and from my own yeah. can be a kind of proof of what drag is and how healing and positive it can be in the world. I don't know if those people can be convinced, but a, a official record sometimes contributes to a, a gradual cultural shift. Does the backlash now feel like the backlash of, of before, of, of decades ago, of, of centuries ago? It's more specific, I think, because of the increased visibility for trans people. Within the 20th century, the medical industry has really, maybe medical and medical discoveries have evolved more linearly than culture. Yeah. And there's an increased understanding of how many people experience dysphoria, of what um, gender affirming care, like medication and surgeries can do for someone's mental health. Yeah. So now it's we kind of can't go back from there. We've seen that it can save people's lives, yeah. um, and we have to make adjustments. But I think that gives drag a different dimension because we are so connected, drag and the trans community. This is a stage for voicing all the different experiences that people in our community have, including the, a real one of being trans. And drag sometimes is a, a trial ground for trans people to explore themselves for the first time. And I think that makes it more threatening. A lot of the times I hear uh, folks come on and, and talk uh, to talk about um, what's going on right now in 2023, it's often like this. It's a drag performer talking to a cishet person. What, what conversations are, are drag performers having with one another at this time? Some of us are a little scared, and I think we don't want to say that outwardly. Yeah. We, we want to say, when it comes to giving advice to young people, like, don't be scared. Yeah. Be yourself. Go out there. Mm -hmm. But I think the the... The weapons that people are showing up to drag events with, the threats of killing us yeah. are actually really hard to like sleep with at night or wake up with or go out and be yourself. And it's also such a disconnect because people don't really say that to our face. So it's things we get online. It's it's seeing someone at a distance or someone shouts something in passing. It's like it's never quite real but it's it's this looming threat and that's so confusing and we're also like exhausted defending our right to exist yeah. <laughs> when we've harmed no one we've only helped people so i think it's exhaustion and a little fear and then a commitment we're like okay and let's get our talking points straight because we don't want to be <laughs> too depressed yeah, <laughs> in of front of the world I, I really appreciate you sharing that with me um i feel like a lot of our conversation up to this point has revolved around like little hints who I actually am, Dracula, Wicked Witch of the West, <laughs> Fulbright, conversations in the middle of the street in Russia, right. your mom, your dad, oh, I'm getting a picture of who I really am. But we don't stop figuring out who we are at when we're in our 20s or when, you know, like there's no end to like, no. oh, all of a sudden I started performing drag. I'm done. I did it. <laughs> How about writing this book? Like, do you feel like, can, can you speak to a way maybe you were changed just by writing this book? Yeah, I love that question, because I think like the process of writing the book was piecing together all these all these different parts, 
many of which I didn't think would go together at all. A lot of these stories I had never brought into my drag story because I'm like, that doesn't that doesn't fit with my vision of Sasha Velour and her fabulous alien self. Uh, but I see that it is all me. These real things that happened, the history, and and that the reality is I'm I'm still figuring out who I am. And that's all right. Like I get to do that in this big way um, and share it with my community and with people who are interested. And I, I hope I, I keep evolving. I, I In the end, I, I sketch out like an ideal future for myself, at least as I'm imagining it right now. And it's to become a grandma like I had, <laughs> like someone who has a wardrobe of clothes and let's the next generation play around in it and make it their own and make fun of the clothes and turn them into something else. And if I can do that with clothing or with ideas about gender or art or queer people, like that would be such a success. And just to be someone cheering people on, that's kind of my dream. It's a really wonderful book and I really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for coming in. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you, Tom.